Okay. Dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, dear Rick, dear Jens, thank you very much for inviting me to give a presentation here at the Spine Trauma Summit. Um, fortunately, I could not attend in person because uh, Air France canceled my flight. Um, that's uh, a pity, but uh, I'm happy to give a virtual talk about osteoporotic fractures, about classifying them, and later on about how to <clears throat> enhance fixation. Uh, my name is Klaus Schnacker. I'm an orthopedic spine surgeon from Erlangen in Bavaria in Germany. Um, the idea of this talk is to, excuse me, yeah, is um, to give you a little bit of understanding about the morphological characteristics of osteoporotic spinal fractures, to classify them according to the aerospine DGO classification, and to identify risk factors for conservative treatment. Um, well, we have to face the, uh, the, the truth that osteoporotic fractures are steadily increasing. And to date, already in my clinical department, we see more osteoporotic fractures than fractures caused by trauma in younger patients. And this, um, this will continue to um, be the same in well, all over the world in all countries. And therefore, it's good that we think about how to treat them, how to classify them right now rather than when it's too late. So before I start with uh, the classification, I would like to give you some facts about osteoporotic fractures. Most commonly, they are either A1 or A3 with uh, uh, regard to the aerospine classification system. B and C type injuries are uncommon, as well as neurological deficits. We made a study with more than 600 patients, and we had only 2.5% patients um, uh, complaining about a neurological deficit due to the fracture. On the other hand, progressive kyphosis is quite common, especially if the T-score is low, especially if it's below minus three. So it makes sense to measure the T-score. Different morphologies and the natural course um, uh, can we see in comparison to healthy bone fractures, so they behave differently. The, um, that means that the morpholo morphology differs from healthy bone fractures. They do not look exactly like the, uh, like the ones in the younger patients. The morphology can change over time, sometimes leading or ending up with highly unstable situations. The morphology does not depend on whether the patient suffered from a trauma or not. So by just looking at the images, you cannot distinguish whether the patient had a trauma or not. That means the classification is definitely, uh, it's meaningful to have a classification which works for both the classical insufficiency fracture without trauma or where for the fractures with some minor trauma where patients have osteoporosis. Most important clinical parameters for the patients are pain and mobilization. And of course, comorbidity, sarcopenia, uh, frailty can or will alter our treatment decisions. That's quite important. The existing class or classifications for osteoporotic fractures were already uh, invented uh, 60 years ago. However, the classifications here, which I put up here, were didn't really meet surgical needs. So in, in fact, none of the classifications really uh, was successful in, in the surgical area. In uh, Central Europe, is, uh, we use a lot, or we used a lot the genome classification, which you can see here. Our internal medicine doctors use it, still use them. However, from a, from a surgical point of view, whether to operate or not, how to stabilize, et cetera, it's not really helpful. 2005, Sujita uh, proposed a classification based on MRI only. Uh, they found out with roughly 80 cases that there are certain subtypes who are, with, are um, likely to fail with conservative treatment. You see them here in the, in the upper line, in the upper row. So, but this, even this classification was not really helpful um, because so not so many people really use it. So requirements for meaningful classification are that it should include all types of osteoporotic fractures. It should respect the special osteoporotic pack patterns. It should be linked to treatment. And finally, it should be easy and simple. And so everybody can memorize it. So in a combined effort of the AOSPA knowledge from trauma, as well as the osteoporotic fracture working group of the spine section, which I had the honor to lead for over 10 years, uh, from the German Orthopedic and Trauma Society, we have developed the so-called AOSPINE DGO osteoporotic fracture classification or short OF classification. It has only five subtypes, relatively easy to memorize. It starts with a simple bone edema and ends up with a severe deformity. It reflects a typical osteoporotic fraction morphologies and it's based on CT scan, MRI, and X-rays, mainly on CT scan plus MRI. <clears throat> 
The classification, the OF classification is um, uh, created for patients having osteoporosis. That means a T-score less than minus 2.5. Classically, when they have an insufficiency fracture or if the osteoporosis is a comorbidity, so the patient had a minor trauma and but has osteoporosis, in that case, we would use the osteoporotic uh, classification. In all the other cases, we still can use the aospine thoracolumbar fracture classification system. So the morphologies are, or the uh, categories are um, uh, um, uh, illustrated here. We start with an OF1, that means no deformation, but a vertebral body edema in the MRI steer sequence. What does it mean? Typically, it's something you accidentally find on MRI that they say, oh, there's another fracture maybe, or oh, I didn't expect this fracture to be there. So when then when you may go back then with this knowledge to the CT scan, you may recognize it. You may see, ah, oh, yeah, there's a fracture. But typically in the first hand, you do not see it on x-rays, uh, so neither on x-rays nor on, on the CT scans, but it's clear vertebral body edema in the MRI steer sequence. We do have this in the sacrum as well. Sometimes that we just have an, um, an edema on one or both sides, but we do not really clearly see a fracture already. The OF2 means deformation of one end plate. The OF3 is a deformation of one end plate with a distinct posterior wall involvement. So that looks a little bit like the um, incomplete burst type injury. Uh, OF4 is a deformation of both end plates with or without posterior wall involvement. And finally, OF5 are injuries with either anterior or posterior tensionment failure. And that looks like this here, like this illustration. So OF1, not, no deformation, no clear deformation, but an edema. OF2, one end plate is deformed. Mostly the upper one could be the lower one as well. There's no or even a minor uh, posterior wall involvement. OF3 here, uh, one end plate deformity. Typically the upper one could be the lower one as well, but the clear distinct posterior wall involvement. OF4, both end plates, always both end plates involved. Could, be, could look like a complete burst type injury with posterior wall involvement. Could be a vertebral plana, could be a fishbone, or could be a pincer type. And finally, OF5, where mostly the posterior uh, tension band is, is uh, either ruptured or fractured. So the fracture runs through the uh, spinous process, or the, the ligaments are elongated or even ruptured. It's, but and sometimes it can be the anterior tension band as well. So if you have a look on the, uh, on the uh, uh, X-rays or on the CT scans or even MRIs, you would look, if you want to classify and use this algorithm, you would look whether you have an anterior posterior tension band failure, then it's an over five. If not, you look whether both end plates are deformed. If so, you automatically have an over four. If you have a deformation of only one end plate, then you would check whether the, the posterior wall is clearly involved, means more than one fifth typically, if you want to measure it. But when you see, well, there's definitely a posterior wall involvement, it's an over three. Everything else, minor or even no posterior wall involvement means OF2. And, and you don't, if you don't have any deformation, but you see on MRI, you see an edema, then it would be an OF1. Typically, this is a, a classical a distribution of the fractures. So OF1 and OF5 are rather rare. The majority of fractures are OF3, OF4, and then OF2. Here are some examples again to make it a little bit more clearer. No deformation and OF1. So how does it look like? Here's an example. You can see on the left side, the CT scan. You can see the lower uh, fracture right cl clearly. But when you look two levels above, I think it's difficult to say that whether this is a fracture or not. But then the MRI, you see that, oh, there's an, uh, there's an edema in this steer sequence. So if you have this, that would be a classical OF1. OF2 means a deformation of one plate, upper end plate or lower end plate with or with, or with only minor posterior wall involvement. Here's an example on x-ray. You can see, well, there's a deformation of the upper end plate, no posterior wall involvement. And you see here, no posterior wall, so it's an OF2. Oh, another one, OF2 here with MRI, you can see here the edema. You can see here the edema as well, but there's definitely no posterior wall. And it's only one end plate affected, OF2. But even if you would have a minor, like here in that case, and whether you see the error, a minor posterior wall involvement, it would still be an O of one, uh, O of two, excuse me. We do not talk about fractures. We rather talk about deformations because the osteoporotic fracture, as I told you, differ a little bit from morphological point of view. So they have, um, they have more deformations, sometimes cracks, sometimes they look, sometimes a classical fracture, but they can look differently. So we, we decided to talk 
for about deformation rather than about fractures. Uh, the OAP3 is then the one with the distinct posterior wall involvement. So a classical bur incomplete burst type injury, like here you clearly can see that half, almost half of the posterior wall is involved, um, or here in, that, in, the, in the CT scan, um, one end plate deformation and a clearly posterior wall involvement. The OAP4 can look differently, or however, all of them have both in pla end plates involved. So whenever you have both end plates involved, it's automatic, it becomes an OF4, whether it's a loss of vertebral frame structure, like a complete burst, whether it's a vertebral body collapse or a pincer type. Um, so here are some examples. So this looks more like a uh, complete burst type injury on the left side. So both end plates plus the posterior wall are affected. The middle one is something similar. Uh, so, but both have a, uh, a deformation of both end plates. Um, we do not look so much on the age of the fracture because the, the fracture can evolve, they can change how they look over time. So as long as the patient has pain and we see some uh, activity in MRI, we still classify it with, the, with this fracture classification. So it's not only for the acute and fresh fractures, like in that case here. You know, you see that it's definitely a situation which goes on for a longer time. However, there's, uh, there's an intervertebral cleft, but if we classify it, it's still an OR4 because both end plates are clearly affected. Uh, another example here, pincer type injuries, uh, the middle one especially, where the posterior wall is not really involved, but like a pincer, uh, um, the, uh, both end plates are involved. So this is a pincer type. So all of them, we subsumize in OR4. Finally, the OR5, there are the injuries with the anterior region with our posterior tension band failure. As I told you, it could either be an elongation of the ligaments. So sometimes over the time, they just um, um, rupture or get elongated, uh, like in the sacrum as well. We can see this there too. And or you have a clear fracture through the spinous process. Here an example where you can see that the uh, distance, the interspinous distance is widened. widened so that is a clear sign of a distraction typically comes over the time, and that would be an OF5. Here, another example on the left side. Uh, in the front, it's like an OF3, but in the back, you can see there's a horizontal line running through the spinous process. This was a fracture. So this is a OF5, and in the middle part, you can see that there's an, a kind of avulsion of the posterior ligament uh, where the arrow is, so this would be an OF5 as well. Finally, the anterior uh, tension band failure can happen as well. You can see here kind of hyperextension injury where the anterior wall is elongated, whereas a rupture of the or injury of the anterior tension band. And this can look differently like on the CT scan on the right. So how to treat these uh, uh, patients? Well, this is definitely a good discussion and <laughs> topic on its own. Well, we have uh, options like conservative, of course, which is definitely something which uh, people in the United States or in North America do. However, here in Central Europe, especially in Germany, we augment a lot. So we use typically kyphoplasty, uh, not that much vertebroplasty. Um, percutaneous uh, posterior stabilization is very popular. So roughly... Um, half of the patients get, uh, when we operate, half of the patient get augmentation, half of them get kind of percutaneous posterior stabilization. And finally, in some cases, we still open, uh, stabilize openly and posterior or sometimes even posterior anterior. So here are some options, you know, for OF1, OF2, or 3 if there's surgery necessary, we would recommend to perform kyphal vertebroplasty because typically that still works. Short percutaneous hybrid constructs, that means percutaneous screw fixation with augmented screws. I will talk about this later on, plus the uh, index vertebral body, which gets an augmentation with PMMA. This so-called hybrid constructs, we would uh, recommend for OR3 and OR4 fractures and long percutaneous or open uh, hybrid constructs are necessarily for, or necessary for OR4, but definitely for OR5 fractures or for multiple fractures. Here are some examples for even anterior posterior construct plus minus osteotomies. So in some cases, it's necessary that we perform even bigger surgery in the elderly patients um, in order to get achieve a good result. So finally, if uh, you consider in the majority of cases conservative treatment, 
uh, you should uh, some, uh, consider some aspects. So roughly one fourth of the patients will suffer from three or more fractures per year. So there's a high chance that they get another fracture within the first year. Um, there are, so half of, a quarter of them have already concomitant spinal fractures, especially if the T-score is low and they have already pre-existing fractures. Um, conservative treatment can fail, especially with low uh, Hounsfield units or so low bone mineral density as well as um, which you can measure as a CT scan at L1. I will come to this in the next talk. And finally, the incidence of uh, new fractures after augmentation is similar to conservative treatment. So if you operate, you do not take the patient or put the patient at risk that he or she will get another fracture. So it's the same like you would treat them conservatively. We have performed a systematic review where we found that higher age, low bone mineral density, um, a little higher BMI, as well as a high modified frailty index are risk factors for failed conservative treatment, and especially the low T-score below minus three. So everything minus three should keep you um, in, uh, should keep you alert that these patients are prone to fail. Further, some um, radiological uh, data like initial height loss, intervertebral clefts, uh, thoracic lumbar junction area, decompensated the sagittal balance, and some of the specific MR fractures, fracture types according to the Gita I told you before. Just at the end, a case example, quickly a 74 year old female, severe osteoporosis and L2 fracture OF3, you can see it here in, the, in that part. So up one deforma a deformation of one end plate plus posterior wall, patient was mobile, had relatively low pain. So we, we performed our um, uh, score system. Finally, we decided to, to treat conservatively, and, but we already had the issue that uh, T-score was relatively low. We started with the conservative treatment, but it failed. You, three weeks later, you can see that now that looks like an OF4, both end plates are involved, and this is mainly due to this low T-score. We would say and now patients is still mobile, but has severe pain. And then um, here our score, which is not topic of this talk today, but we will use in our daily practice to decide whether surgery is necessary or not, said, okay, now we should go for surgical treatment and we performed augmentation, which works quite nicely over two years. So in conclusion, the classification as well as the score, if you if you want to use it and the treatment recommendation are still expert-based, however, they reflect the actual treatment status and knowledge. Conservative therapy is definitely the first choice in mobile patients and if they have relatively low uh, pain. Kyphoplast and hybrid stabilizations are the surgical workers. We typically use comorbidities, adjacent fractures and implant failures, however, are still challenging. Uh, if you go for surgery and please don't forget to perform or to start with an adequate medication for the osteoporosis. Here are some, some take-home literature. We published this open source in Global Spine in 2018. Um, there's already a, an app available for the classification. The AO Spine we have performed or we, we made a video about the classification. So everything is open source if you want to get more information. And this, this I would like to thank you for your attention. Outstanding, Klaus. That was the most comprehensive discussion I've ever heard on the classification of osteoporotic compression fractures. Uh, we're running a little behind, so we're going to hold our questions until, until the end.